she's a historian who, for more than 20 years, has studied aspects of uh, Victorian police history. From 1988 to 1995, he was the manager of the Victoria Police Historical Union, during which time he was locked up by the police until he created a police museum and a very fine one, as I said. Gary has lectured widely on police history and the use of police records, and is the author of three books and about 20 articles on these topics. His books include Cops and Robbers, a guide to researching 19th century police and criminal records, uh, written with Helen Harris. And if you ever want to know about uh, anything with police and researching it, that's your Bible. Um, he's also written in the performance of Duty with Ralph Staveley and Gavin Brown, and for God's sake, bring the crackers, which is uh, a great story, and you'll find out more about the major police crime series in my first display area. Gary is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society of Victoria, an honorary fellow of the University of Melbourne, and an honorary associate of Museum Victoria, where he was the 2001 Thomas Ramsden Science and Humanities Fe Fellow. So, let's talk about that. Thank you, Diane. Now, I've, I've always thought, I've thought for many, many years at least, and this, this uh, looking here now only confirms how amazing the drawing power of the two words Ned Kelly is. Uh, I hope that... Um, I hope that not too many of you are going to be disappointed because uh, uh, I'm not really going to talk about Ned Kelly but so much as uh, aspects of Victoria Police history that, that have been altered because of the whole Ned Kelly incident. And I particularly hope that none of you are Collingwood followers because I wouldn't want you to be disappointed twice in one day. <laughs> and from that you can infer where my loyalties lie. Okay. As the person whose job it was to preserve the material remains of police history and to promote the value of that history, I'm always a little disturbed but also fascinated by the ongoing and seemingly inexhaustible interest that exists in Ned Kelly and his gang. As an area of historical research, the Kelly gang and the deeds of its members has been incredibly rich so much is clearly evident from the enormous body of published material that has been forthcoming. In the 100 years following the execution of Kelly, there were at least 350 published works dealing with some aspect of the subject of the outlaw and his gang, and many more appeared in the wake of the centenary of his capture and trial, and indeed continue to appear. There is no doubt that the police force played a central role in the whole saga that is sometimes referred to as the Kelly outbreak. Indeed, since its creation in January 1853, the force has been part of every major incident that has occurred within Victoria. I think it's interesting then that the number of published works on the history of policing in Victoria is considerably less than the number devoted to the activities of criminals. It seems the police do not feature greatly as a subject of serious historical interest in Australia generally, not just here in Victoria. There are more works on the Kelly Gang alone than there are on all police forces in Australia from their inception in the 18th century. There's clearly a great popular interest in criminals, which might easily explain much of this disparity in published output. But even the scholarly series Australian Dictionary of Biography is less than even-handed. Although it contains articles on Kelly, John Wren, Squizzy Taylor and Edward Lewonski, all well-known criminals, it doesn't include anything on many notable policemen, such as Senior Constable Fred Downey, who in a world first pioneered the use of radio in police cars, or Superintendent Lionel Potter, who initiated the use of fingerprints in Australia. Well, I'm not going to talk about criminals anymore. Rather, I'm going to briefly outline a few of the enduring impacts that one particular outbreak of criminal activity had on Victoria Police. One of the features of Victoria Police, and probably of police forces everywhere, is that it is largely reactive. Most initiatives are, in fact, responses 
to change situations or newly perceived threats. New strategies are developed to take account of new types of crime. There are many examples of this within the history of Victoria Police. To mention a couple, when Victoria was, of a, was a colony of predominantly rural population, there was a section of Victoria Police that just investigated <coughs> cases of stolen stock, that is, cattle and sheep. A contemporary example is the creation of specific groups such as the Piranha Task Force, set up to investigate more than 20 gangland murders in Melbourne. Today, such responses come from within the force itself, but this hasn't always been the case. The changes wrought to Victoria Police in the wake of the Kelly outbreak, for example, with one notable exception, were imposed as a result of the Royal Commission. There are at least three ways that I want to mention in which the Kelly outbreak had lasting impacts on Victoria Police as an organisation. Firstly, it brought an end to the careers of three of the highest ranking and longest serving officers. Chief Commissioner Captain Frederick Standish was unceremoniously dumped from his position within weeks of the Glen Rowan siege. Assistant Commissioner Charles Nicholson and Superintendent Francis Hare were stood down during the Longmore Royal Commission and neither man returned to duty. These three officers had each played a major role in the two-year hunt for the Kelly Gang. Ultimately, they were undone by their own inefficiencies and the intense rivalry between officers at the highest echelons of Victoria Police. Superintendent John Sadlier had not, only, had not been as closely involved in the hunt as his contemporaries, but even so, the Commission found him guilty of, quote, several errors of judgment, unquote, and he was placed at the bottom of the seniority list. This loss of experience had enduring ramifications for the force. It is likely that Charles Nicholson would have succeeded Sandish as Chief Commissioner. Instead, the top job went to Hussein Malone Chomley, a superintendent whose greatest advantage seemed to be that he had not been involved in the hunt for the Kelly Gang. At the same time, he was the first career policeman to become Chief Commissioner in Victoria, and he had served at all ranks of the force. It's interesting to note in passing the fate of the senior officers compared uh, sorry. It's interesting note in passing the fate of the senior officers compared to that of a contemporary but lesser ranking member of the force. Detective Senior Constable Thomas O'Callaghan. O'Callaghan had, had been involved in the hunt for the Kelly Gang and, like many other members of the detective branch, was singled out for particular censure by the Longmore Royal Commission. Between June and December 1882, he appeared before the board of the commission on five occasions. He did not endear himself to the commissioners. In fact, he was suspended from duty and in October 1882, reprimanded because of his disrespectful demeanour towards the commission while cross-examining a witness. In their report on the detective branch, the commissioners labelled O'Callaghan, along with detectives Nixon and Duncan, as, quote, not, tra not trustworthy, and suggested that their retention in the force is not likely to be attended with credit or advantage to the public service. 